Woohoo! Oda played us. He played us good with this chapter. Through a plot twist, a curveball. Look at that. Um, so this chapter is mad early, and as a result, I'm kind of late with this review. Because each time there's a chapter that's early during the week, it fucks up my schedule. So, yeah, that's the explanation for that. Oda did such a good job playing with our expectations, especially with that cliffhanger that we got last week with the monkey crying. You know, looking like he was really, really disturbed and shit. I was like, oh, so you weren't really, I mean, you were in shock, but it's the good type of shock. I have the cover page there with the Frankie family looking at Frankie's wanted poster. Then we start off with Robin, Brooke, and Frankie running to warn everybody about the samurai. It's interesting because like you see like the, you know, the crouching tiger hidden dragon, like the paintings from, from um, Kanjiro. So they're dead. They've gone back to being paintings. But if you look closely at Ryunosuke's painting, you'll see that, you know, uh, Robin's flowers are still there. <laughs> I just thought that was great. Anyway, the chapter as a whole is pretty simple. Uh, you have the reunion of Momonosuke, uh, Kanjiro, and Kinemon, and then the monkey starts ringing the bell, brings everybody together. At one point, there, there was this like really funny moment. Yo, seriously, like Neko Mamushi is an amazing character. Definitely one of my favorite New World characters, like period, for sure. And I think it's because he's the perfect balance between a character being strong yet ridiculous at the same time. And I noticed how Oda specifically decided to give that, that last panel to Nekomamushi. Not Inuarashi, but Nekomamushi specifically. And you see him grinning and all his teeth are showing and shit. So he's like this ferocious beast, but he's just so fucking happy. And he's like, you know, even if it meant the demise of this kingdom, we would never rat out our friend to the enemy. Holy shit, the loyalty scale just broke. He just broke that shit. And then you have a shot of Luffy going like... It's interesting because recently I think Oda has been showcasing, you know, that concept of loyalty a lot more. And I think it's because it's a lot more valuable in the New World. I mean, it was always valuable, but once you get into the New World territory... You know how Doflamingo was talking about like, oh, they could be treasons and stuff. Who's going to betray who? Like that, that... The fact that you actually stand up for somebody, even if like it costs your life, it could end up killing you is super fucking important when it comes to like building alliances. It kind of reminded me of that scene in Thriller Bark where Kuma shows up and everybody's wounded because, you know, the fight with Moria has just ended, so everybody's drained. And then Kuma says, okay, uh, you know, I won't do anything to you guys if you let me take Luffy or something. If you let me take Straw Hat's head, nothing will happen to you. And then everybody, I mean, particularly the Straw Hats, but then everybody as a whole, they're like, wait, you want us to betray our Nakama? Fuck you! Like, straight up. Everybody was on the same page, just like in Zo. They were like, get the fuck out of here with that shit. You're not getting anything. We're not giving up. Go to hell. And then Kuma says, Urususu shock. And it, he blows everything to smithereens. And the Minx played it off so well. It is ridiculous. Like, how well they pretended not to know shit. It was, it was just amazing. And so now the question becomes, why is Raizo so important, and where the hell is he? Uh, I think, I mean, okay, so he, they say he's safe, right? So they're keeping him safe. I'm assuming, I don't know why I get the feeling that he's inside of the elephant. I think I have a pretty good idea as to, like, what Raizo's influence has been on the mix. In this chapter, when we see Nekomamushi and Inuarashi clash, we get a shot of electricity, like, coming out of the clash. And this is not the first time that we've seen the Minx use some type of electricity. We've seen Carrot use uh, electricity when she was like about to hit Zoro at one point. We've seen the Minx use it together like as a unit when they were, you know, fighting up against Jack's forces. So, Raizo, the word Rai in Japanese, I think, if I'm not mistaken, I think means thunder. So could it be possible that Raizo, as a way of saying thank you to the Minx for protecting him and keeping his secret, could it be possible that Raizo actually granted them some type of capability or ability that has to do with electricity? Maybe that's why he's so valuable to Kaido and Jack. Maybe that's why Jack was looking for him. Because he knows or he has this ability or he can produce this certain type of technology that can allow people to use electricity as a weapon but in, in greater quantities. Like have that shit, like that weapon or that technology distributed, you know, at a very large scale. Much like the artificial devil fruits. What I like most about this chapter, you know, aside from everything else, 
is that you know how last week I was complaining about that that party that they had midway and I was like what the fuck like what what happened with this why are they partying like this all of a sudden what's going on that party now makes a lot more sense because technically speaking this chapter pretty much ties up like one of the major plot points of Zo which is the, the the whole thing with the samurai and the minx the only thing we would be looking for after this, technically, is an explanation. We just need to find out more about the Kogetsu clan's relationship with the Minx. So, Zo, once again, like this is going to be a very significant arc in terms of history. But as of right now, I think Luffy, if he wanted to, he could just straight up go to Big Mom. Because, let's be honest, Luffy doesn't give a shit about people's past or history. I mean, he, he only cares about it in terms of how it affects the present. And honestly, because Zo is so old, I think this is going to be some Void Century type of shit. So you can have that, you can tell that, that history, but Luffy doesn't have to be there to hear it. So you could be working on developing two different plot lines and addressing those issues at the same time. So narratively speaking, this, this could be the beginning of the end of the Zo arc. If, if nothing else happened, because there's no more conflict. You see what I'm saying? Nothing is happening in Zo that that needs like that requires a confrontation. I guess you could say that the whole thing with the cat and the dog, like you know, their relationship could be a little bit better, but that's not that big of a deal because they're still working together. They still accomplish the same type of goals. They are organized, so that's not that big of a deal. The only thing that I think could extend the arc further would be if somebody new or if a new threat comes into Zo, meaning that either Jack comes back super fucking pissed with more men to fuck shit up, um, you know, or, or Weevil shows up, or somebody, somebody else has to show Oda has to throw a wrench in this shit. Because other than that, it's like, okay, what else is there? Like, we can move on to the next thing. I've said this before, I'm putting my money on Jack coming back just because of the fact that Kaido knows, he is certain that Raizo is on that, that elephant. He knows it. And the whole thing about, like, the amount of, like, information, access to information that the Yonkos have, that was foreshadowed in the previous chapter by Peckham's when he's like, this is true power. Like, the Yonkos fucking know. Like, if, if Kaido tells you Raizo is on Zo, then you can be damn sure you're gonna find an electric fucking ninja aboard that fucking huge ass elephant. So I do think Jack is gonna come back to Zo, and I don't think that Luffy is gonna be around for that. I think Luffy will be gone by the time that happens. Now, here's the thing. If that's not the case, if Luffy and Jack meet, then the entire story gets put on hold. Like everything gets pushed back. The entire rescue Sanji thing gets put on hold because Luffy's gonna have to fight Jack unless, and this is why I'm banking on Zoro. How epic would it be if Jack shows up just as Luffy's about to leave and Luffy's about to fight him and then Zoro steps in and he's like, Oi, Sancho, leave him to me. You go get that cook. That'd be some epic shit, you know? Because now it's like the Straw Hats, now that they're aligned with the Minks, they also have something to protect, which is Raizo. So that gives them motivation to be like, okay, well, first of all, the Minks can't leave because most of them are wounded anyway. So they need to stay in their hometown. They need to stay in their home island. And But yeah, I do think that they can form a front in case there's an invasion by, by Kaido's men or Jack's men. I can picture Usopp just like debating over what, what option is, is the less shitty, like the less fucked up. Because it's like, okay, like what do I do? Do I stay here and fight Jack or do I go and, you know, I go with Luffy to face off against a Yonko. Speaking of Usopp, uh, there's just one thing that really caught my attention in this chapter. Like he really starts bawling. Like he starts like just, just streams of, of tears and snot because of, you know, this act of loyalty from the Minx uh, towards Raizo. And I'm kind of wondering if this is going to serve as an example for him to follow in the future, even though he's, he's a loyal guy. But, you know, I, I wonder if, like, he felt so bad about this because of the incident in Dress Rosa when he actually ran away from helping the, the Tontadas. I mean, he came back to help them eventually, but you know what I mean. And actually, Frankie and Nami are also crying. It's just that, like, I think Oda, like, yeah, the panel with Usopp crying is a little bit bigger. Like, there's one shot where he's just like, oh, you would have died. So I wonder why Oda did that intentionally. Because the whole concept kind of plays on Usopp's main theme, which is lying, right? So it's kind of like they, they lied. They, they lied their asses off to protect somebody, even if, they, if it meant their death. So I kind of wonder if Usopp's ever going to be doing that in the future. That he lies so fucking hard to protect somebody he cares about. Because if that happens, then this could be considered some type of foreshadowing for that. 
out of the chapters that we've gotten this year, I think this is kind of like my least favorite, in all honesty. But it's still a pretty, a pretty decent, solid chapter. So, you know, uh, those are my thoughts. Thank you so much for watching. Like the review if you did. I appreciate that. Subscribe to my channel for more One Piece if you haven't already. And comment down below with your thoughts. Thanks, guys. Whoa. Bye.